and welcome to Easter Hack 21, which happens in 2024, just to confuse you. It's day three in the evening. I think we can agree it's evening by now. Um, this talk is about Big Iron. So if you're in IT and someone talks about Big Iron, it's mainframes, the IBM host. But this time, our speaker is talking about a different kind of Big Iron. You probably have seen them before, you probably read about them before. And as you can probably imagine, those big, iron, big irons that, that he's going to talk about, they need IT, and that not always works out as we might expect. So please welcome with a very warm round of applause for the talk, Cybersecurity Afloat or Securing Very Big Iron, Pricks. Hello. Nice to have you here. My name is Pirks. I've been um, with the Chaos Computer Club since time immemorial, I would say, 1980-something. Um, I'm working a lot with ships and other st things that float. And yes, these things need computers both to operate them economically, that's the stuff that looks and feels like computers, and to actually make them go. So, what's a ship? This is a typical modern container ship. Um, very large container carrier, built 2023, so not very old. About 23,000 20 foot containers. That's the one that uh, you see on trucks, would fit on this one. We're talking about 58,000 kilowatts of power. We're talking about almost 400 meter length. We are talking about 225,000 tons of carrying capacity, not counting the weight of the ship. And all this is manned by about 23 people. Now looking at what do we have in terms of computers on a ship like this. We have the steering system. So when the ship moves through the water, you have a rudder, you t put it, uh, turn it to the right, then the ship goes to the right, you turn it to the left, the ship goes to the left. And when the ship doesn't go, move through the water, then the rudder does nothing. You have propulsion, usually a big diesel engine, cylinder size, around about one telephone booth, so something like one meters um, be um, bearing, two and a half meters um, displacement, so that's quite a lot. And this times, say, 12 cylinders. Modern ships have electronically controlled engines, so without power they don't actually move. And what's nice about these ships, um, diesel engines, is they are directly coupled to the propeller. So the crankshaft on the diesel engine basically goes straight through the propeller at the end of the ship. So if you want to turn the uh, power around, you basically stop the engine and restart it in the opposite direction. There's no gearbox and nothing else. You also have power generation. You have auxiliary diesel engines that you can fire up to make electricity. While the ship is underway, you generally make electricity from the main engine with a generator coupled to the main shaft. Um, but you also have the smaller diesel engines, smaller as in 2,000 horsepower or so, um, just to make electricity. You have navigation systems. Most modern ships do not have paper charts anymore. They have electronic sea charts. So these are important because they tell the captain how deep the water is and where to go. And they need to be fixed every, every week. They come, uh, you get co uh, corrections. Something has changed. So you need to correct them. So you need to download updates every week. And of course, you have communication and IT. When we put this into two categories, we have information technology. That's the stuff that looks, feels, smells like a computer. Communications, office work, all the paperwork stuff, passage planning, so where do we go uh, step by step maintenance, what needs to be fixed next week, 
Some stuff needs to be done every 1,000 running hours. Some stuff needs to be done every one month, for example. That needs to be planned. And documentation, so all this paperwork stuff. And then you have operations technology. And that's, in my mind, the more interesting stuff. That is power generation. That's the control systems for engine management, electronic engines, propulsion and steering, navigation charts, the autopilot, um, collision avoidance. So all the stuff that runs from the radar, for example, so that you don't run into another ship. Okay, what can go wrong? If something goes wrong in IT, well, you can lose money, you can lose time, of course, you can lose reputation, so customers might be unhappy when you're not moving because of an IT problem. But yeah, so what, in a way? If you look at the OT stuff, but you lose steering in the wrong moment, or something like that, then you have not only a loss of money or reputation, but also you can um, have impacts on the environment or human life. When we look at other kind of ships that I'm frequently on, a drill ship, what is that? That's a ship with a drilling tower on top that you use to drill for oil or gas. These things are quite advanced. They can drill something like, in f something like four kilometers water depth and drill up to 30 to 40,000 feet, so 12 kilometers deep. And actually, they can drill not only directly down, but they can actually dr drill down and then do a curve and drill horizontally following the uh, formation so they can actually drill in a curve. What's interesting is when the water is so deep, you can't actually anchor the ship with an an uh, dropping an anchor on the ground and um, stick it there. You need to use dynamic positioning. So the ship is actually virtually anchored. There's no physical connection to the seabed except the drill string that you have here. That's basically a long pipe um, that goes to the seafloor and then further down into the hole that you are drilling. When we look at important control systems here, we have the drilling, the drawworks, fingerboard, which is the place where you store the drilling pipe. Iron roughneck, that is the system that you use to connect the length of drill, uh, the length of drill pipes are about 12 meters each. So you need to um, screw them on. When you want to drill a couple of kilometers, you need to screw a lot of these together pipe handling, mud pumps, so the, the well generally has a higher pressure here, there's a formation pressure from natural gas, so to make sure that this doesn't just come up when it wants to, you, ba you balance the pressure here with, with mud, which is basically water with some um, minerals inside, so you uh, change the density or adjust the density of that stuff so that it counterbalances the pressure in the well. So the mud pumps are quite important. You have fire and gas detection, obviously. When there's a fire, you want to know and you want to be able to take actions. Some wells have also um, poisonous gas inside, H2S, hydrogen di disulfide. As long as you can smell it, it smells like rotten eggs, you're fine. But it's a nerve gas, so you are, when you're not smelling it anymore because the concentration is too, uh, too high, then you are in acute danger of losing your life. So um, that detection is important. Power generation, of course, these things need power and they need a lot of it. So they have typically six to eight diesel generators. They're independent of each other. They are not all in the same place on the ship so that even if you have a fire or um, some mechanical malfunction in one of them, it's not a big deal. And usually you're running only, say, three out of six, and the others are spare, but when the weather is bad, you need more. So and there's an automation that turns the engines on and off as needed, depending on the actual power de demand. For dynamic positioning, 
you have thrusters underneath the ship that can turn 360 degrees and can move the ship in all directions. So basically to keep it in place. How does the ship know where it is? You have GPS receivers, of course, but you also put some, have an angle indicator here that measures the angle of the, um, the drill string or um, um, so if the ship drifts off then the angle changes and you know that you have to counteract that. And you have acoustic buoys, you put some acoustic emitters here and here and um, you measure the acoustic signals um, and use that as a very precise reference. And another very important system that you have here is a, uh, it's a blowout preventer. That's a big valve sitting on the seafloor. You drill through that big valve and if something goes really wrong under the surface, you can close this to close off the well. And if um, just closing around the drill string doesn't help, you have ram shears that can actually cut through the drill string. Can completely isolate the well by cutting all this off. Of course, that's something that you don't do lightly, but you can. If needed, you can do that. So it's an important, um, it's an important um, safety device. So what can possibly go wrong? I have a couple of examples for where things went wrong, and this, of course, is something that all of you have probably seen this video. Um, that's just a week ago, when a container ship sailing out of Baltimore Harbor hit a bridge. What happened? The, um, the ship lost power right in the wrong moment. Just two minutes before crashing into the bridge, the ship had a f uh, complete power loss. So they lost the ability to t turn the rudder around. So they couldn't steer. They had enough power for communication still. So the pilot um, on board called um, the local authorities to close off the bridge. There was construction work going on the bridge, so the um, local traffic police already had people on both sides of the bridge, which was very fortunate. So they um, could basically close off the bridge so that no cars could go on further. There were, there were a couple of uh, construction workers on the bridge, and um, well, two were rescued, um, and six are supposed to be dead. Two were found already. So that's, a, of course, not a very fortunate event. But without the police already being there, the loss of lives would have been much bigger. That was not a cyber incident. It was actually a mechanical failure of um, the, um, looks like dirty fuel um, in the engine that stopped the main engine. But um, it could have been a cyber incident and we have seen electronics failures that have very similar consequences. So the power outage, caused a loss of steering, and loss of steering caused the, cross into the, uh, the crash into the bridge. So another example where, again, an electronics failure, or actually a software error, contributed to, um, to a significant problem on a cruise vessel. Um, Carnival Splendor in 2010. The ship had a fire in the engine room. That should not have been a big deal. Why? Because of safe return to port regulations, modern cruise ships have two independent engine rooms. If one of them breaks down or has a fire, you basically turn it off and can, with limited uh, power, but you can still go home. You can easily sail to the next port, no problem. Um, but since the electrical switchboard that con uh, coordinates the electrical power distribution between the two engine rooms had a software failure, so the takeover from one engine room to the other didn't actually work as designed, that was a single point of failure. That was not considered part of the design. And therefore, what happened? They lost 
the propulsion, but they also lost all the, um, the refrigeration for the food. So, and when you are sailing in the Caribbean, or in this case on the, um, on the other side, um, but in tropical weather, then your lobster doesn't stay fresh very long when you don't uh, have refrigeration. And also, you're losing some essential facilities like toilets. The vacuum toilets don't work. So the US Navy actually supplied them with um, emergency rations, airlifted emergency rations, and quite a number of porta potties um, on board. So, yeah, not exactly what uh, the guests on this cruise um, were looking for. Well, another thing that was not um, an electronic problem, Deepwater Horizon, the, um, that's a semi-submersible um, drilling vessel. You can't really see it, actually, because it's, it's this thing here that's on fire. Um, what happened here was that due to some um, kick in the well, so rising well pressure, um, and too late actual reaction, the, um, the drill string was not centered anymore in the, um, in the hole so that the blowout preventer could not completely close around the drill string. So that's what I told you before. This cutting through the drill string to close off the well did not work. So the, um, the gas, mostly natural gas, escaped from the well they had an, um, a fire on board because something ignited the, um, the escaping gas. And um, unfortunately, 11 people lost their lives. And um, the cleanup operations cost on the order of 30 billion US dollars. The, uh, it took them about 60 days to actually finally close the well. And um, so um, that was a major catastrophic event. And um, I met one of the guys who were on board um, that ship that night and um, um, years later and still had a big impact on that person. Now I think this time is IT. 2017, um, quite a number of logistics companies and others um, were hit by the NotPetya attack. And actually the companies that were hit, mostly were not targeted with collateral damage. Um, Russian state-owned actors um, had attacked the Ukrainian tax soft system. So you, the Ukraine had a tax software uh, very similar to the German Elster system but everybody doing business in the Ukraine needed to use to um, upload tax forms. And um, the attackers compromised an update for that uh, tax software. And um, for example, Maersk, the biggest at the time shipping company in the world, having an office in Odessa, got infected by that. And um, that stopped basically international uh, container transport, which is pretty much all transport except for tanks and um, coal and stuff like that, um, for about 10 days. Maersk alone had to rebuild 45,000 desktops, had to rebuild 4,500 servers, lots of applications, and uh, TNT similar. So Maersk alone uh, was hit by a couple of hundred million dollars uh, losses in that. Plus, of course, the international supply chains that were disrupted by that, very significant. So it's not only OT that can have significant consequences, but also IT. Why do we see these systems as being so vulnerable? Well, first of all, the protocols that are used in these systems over serial lines or field buses, we are not built with security in mind. They are typically 20 years old, um, they are very vulnerable, not only not using encryption, because they were built with a premise, the lines are connected, so an attacker can't get in here. And 
some vendors' protocols are very fragile. You put a couple of bytes on the network um, that the system doesn't ex um, expect and you get alarms like a Christmas tree and the system just crashes. Um, a lot of these systems are using UDP. Um, when they are using Ethernet, they are using UDP. And they are using broadcasts. So that the sending system doesn't have to have a catalog on who is interested in receiving that data, which you would you normally do in um, nowadays. You would probably um, uh, do this with MQTT. They are just firing a bit uh, packets on the network, and any station that wants it can listen and uh, can pick it off the network. They were originally based for industrial control systems. They have hard real-time requirements, of course. Um, you see systems. Last year, I've been on a drilling rig that was just coming fresh from the shipyard that had control systems running Windows 7. So out of, um, out of support when the ship was brand new. We see more and more um, demands for data from OT systems for machine learning and um, other fancy applications. So the um, originally built in isolation is not there that much anymore. And when a system is vulnerable so that it falls over and you uh, look at it strain, uh, strangely, then of course you are running into problems. One thing that uh, control systems engineers need to learn is that hardware faults have very different statistics than software faults. When you have something that fails every 1,000 hours, statistics in hardware, you put in two or three devices and then you're good because they won't fall at the, uh, fail at the same time. But if it's a software bug, then all the devices will fail at the same time. So the statistics are completely different. And this is something that safety people have a hard time to understand when they are not coming with an IT background. So redundancy with the same software doesn't really help. Or when something is vulnerable, then all systems running the same software will be vulnerable in the same way. So updating stuff is not always possible or feasible because you have to, of course, update everything at the same time. You can't do it in production. Why? Hey, when you are sitting on, um, on a firebomb like this, uh, then you won't want to do updates without a good planning and risk assessment. So the air gaps that used to be in the systems are vanishing. Ships used to have very little internet. If at all it was slow, it was expensive, and it had high latency. Ge geostationary satellites basically give you um, 800 milliseconds ping. Because the signal has to travel um, 36,000 kilometers up and 36,000 kilometers down, and a bit of processing in between. So ping is, uh, you will have a bad ping on a satellite link. Now we are getting uh, low Earth orbit satellites since a couple of years that have changed the price picture a lot. So internet on board is more feasible. And since about two years, um, Starlink has been very active in this arena and this is kind of a game changer. Now you get internet speeds and latencies on board very similar to what you get at home and for a much more manageable price point. But this is, of course, also uh, helpful for attackers. And um, more and more systems have remote support capabilities so that the engineers on board can phone up the, um, the manufacturer and the manufacturer can dial in and, um, and um, help them. Sometimes it goes wrong. You can see this steel box here with two padlocks. This came aboard, um, happened because they, um, a service technician did maintenance, software maintenance and updates 
on a blowout preventer. The blowout preventer has two redundant control systems, a blue one and a yellow one, that can be controlled both on a panel on the ship, as well as, if needed, by turning a valve with a remotely operated diving robot, um, turning it directly on the seafloor, pushing buttons on the seafloor. These seat buttons are big, of course, because you need to push them with the robot. And um, you can also use acoustics. You, so you can basically send a sound signal, which travels very far underwater, down to the control pods. Now, you do these updates when the ship is coming from one well, finished with one well, and going to the next one. So when the blowout preventer is stored on deck, on board. Now, the technician mistyped the IP address, so he was working on a, um, on a live drilling BOP, which made a lot of people very unhappy. How could that be? Well, mistyping an address, anybody can do that. But they used the same username and password for all the ships in the fleet. Otherwise, if they would have ship-specific usernames, passwords, nothing would have happened. You would have noticed, oh, it doesn't work. Oh, I got the no wrong number. No problem. But he didn't do that. So, yeah. And now, so they um, weld this stainless steel box over the socket where you can plug in this. This is a remote control cable. And for the remote control to work, you need to plug it in this socket, which is now hidden here. Now, the captain and the chief engineer or in oil terms, the OIM, Offshore Installation Manager and uh, Maintenance Supervisor, um, they need to both independently unlock their padlocks for any remote control to happen here. So that's a hardware firewall. <laughs> so, of course, where there's technology, there are standards. The standards for industrial control systems, especially when it's safety critical, <coughs> is um, IEC 62443, which is quite a set of standards. So when you st print them and stack them, it's about this much. So the relevant one is um, Book 3, Section 3, so 624333, and that defines security levels. Most industrial control systems that we see are actually happening here at security level one and two, uh, zero and one, even though they probably should be somewhere here. Zero is, yeah, don't care, no, don't worry, nothing special. Level one is protection against somebody making honest mistakes. Um, level two is protection against intentional misuse by low-skilled attackers. So, common criminals, um, ransomware attacks, somebody who's not really very well-versed in control systems. Interesting, it gets interesting, um, um, at uh, level three, which is basically people who know what they are doing, qualified hackers, and level four would be usually government actors. For example, when you are uh, drilling, um, drilling an area where um, some governments don't want you to be drilling, say you are drilling in the South China Sea, um, between China and Taiwan, then um, depending on um, which side you are drilling for, um, the other side might take objections and go on an attack. Drilling in the Black Sea, for example, would be pretty much not advisable at the moment, and so on. And of course, we actually see um, logic bombs. We see devices that are put on board quite well hidden, they don't do anything for years. So they, um, they can react on data like the GPS position of the rig. So only when you are drilling in an area that the attacker doesn't like you to drill, then it would uh, break, uh, cause systems to break down. 
So what to do? First of all, you segment your systems into zones and conduits. A zone is stuff, stuff that has the same security requirements. Some control systems um, and so on. And conduits is the defined pathways that data can take between these things. So for example here, this is okay. It's all kind of going in a hierarchy. This, control, this conduit here would not be okay in the standard because you are now having two paths here that data can flow and so you are losing control. You don't have, data can bypass this firewall or this choke point by going this way. And this is something that you don't want. That's all part of your cybersecurity risk assessment. Um, you segment your systems so that you can actually control what data is flowing. And of course you test. So, of course, tests can only prove that you have issues. They can never prove that you don't have any issues. Um, so you need to do quite comprehensive testing, not only of components, but of the systems as a whole. It's difficult to do while the system, uh, chips is in operation because of the risk involved. You can't really do a lot of um, cyber testing, intrusive tests and penetration tests while um, while a ship is actively drilling, for example, or while um, a ship is under sailing in confined waters. In the middle of the Atlantic, yeah, if you lose propulsion in the middle of the Atlantic for 10 minutes, no big deal, unless you're in a storm. Or if you are uh, losing propulsion while you are safely in port, again, you're not going anywhere anyway. So what tools do we use for testing? So if you are looking for a career in this business. Um, it's interesting and it's, um, there's a lot of things um, that can be very challenging, interesting environment. It's also quite well, well paid. Um, so what I normally do use is Kali Linux and I completely wipe and reinstall the laptop for every single, um, for every single drop just to make sure that we're not carrying anything from one chip to the next. Wireshark, bag of adapters like um, adapters for industrial ethernet, RS-485, um, GBX or SFP plus adapters, uh, media converters for fiber. Um, also, when we are working on systems that are live or semi-live, we always use um, a network tab. This makes sure that data is only flowing from the, connect, from the system under test to our systems. It's a one-way road, it can't go back. So we are isolating that even if our laptop would have something nasty on it, we could not add, put any bytes on the network while we are listening. We are also using tools like Nmap, Nessus, of course a notepad, and last not least, eyes, ears and the brain. What else? Yeah, you are working in a harsh environment, in a controlled environment, so you need personal protective equipment. So boiler suit, hard hat, impact gloves, safety boots, goggles, earplugs, this kind of stuff. And you need some special training, or like something called a Boziet. It's a very fun course. You are spending three days learning about firefighting, learning about how to escape a helicopter when it's landing on the water or when it's actually sinking into the water and then when it's sinking into the water and going upside down. So um, you are learn how to um, kick out the, uh, the windows and get out of that sinking helicopter, which is fun. Also you need a medical fitness certificate and you need to have a good plan what you are going to do and for everything that you touch, you need a permit to work. So you need to have a piece of paper where you do your risk assessment, tell the captain what you want to do, and get sign off from the captain. Yes, you can do this between 6 o'clock in the morning until noon. You have a time window where you can do this job. It takes about a week on board to do this. Okay. 
That's all I had here in terms of slides. You probably have some questions, and I'm happy to answer anything you may have. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect on time. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand, feet, tentacles, ear, cat ears, whatever. Um, so we get the uh, question on sc on screen on stream. Oh my. Um, if you want to ask a question in German, that's fine as well. We wanted to have the talk in English, so feel free. Any questions? I'll bring the microphone to you. You don't have to leave the comfort of your seat. Yes, coming. So let's assume you are on a ship, you do an assessment, you find something, what do you do next? You can, since you cannot really change the system because it would require recertification. Yeah. What do we do? Well, we write a report with our findings. Um, the report normally goes to the operator of the, of the ship and um, they then can take the actions necessary. We help them with the actions. Uh, we make recommendations about how to fix this and, um, and also help them, if necessary, negotiate with the man uh, system manufacturer in uh, brainstorming for technical fixes. Sometimes you can use uh, procedural fixes when you can't do technical fix. Um, like saying, okay, this system must not be operated in this manner. Um, you can make sure that all the isolations um, are in place. For example, um, the attack vector of USB um, devices you can um, usually plug with a glue gun um, and uh, and or locking cabinets. So if you um, keep the system physically locked, then the USB attack vector is blocked. So this is one of the potential fixes when you can't um, completely um, secure a system that way, then you need to use a defense in depth ad approach and fix it in some other way. Any other questions? Further questions? Yes. Uh, how do we do this? Uh, hi. Uh, what's the worst or best uh, vulnerability that you found and are willing to and allowed to talk to us and the stream? Um, one that we found, um, and I can talk about it because it's publicized, is is a vulnerability in Siemens S7-300 uh, programmable logic, uh, logic controllers, PLCs, that are very common. And um, this was a denial of service attack. You send one malformed packet on the wire and the system goes into a failure state, which means they need to be power cycled. So you need to physically go there and they can be all over the ship. Um, unplug it and plug it in again. And um, some vendors, system vendors, have used unpatched um, versions of this um, PLC a, min a minimum two years after the, pub uh, the bug was publicized and a fixed, uh, fixed version firmware was um, available. So um, they did not update their stock of PLCs. Um, so the even new systems could be delivered with the, with the bug still there. And um, it, took them com uh, it took them some persuasion um, and I told them, hey, if I would, would need myself in need of a couple million dollars um, for whatever reason, I could go ahead and uh, short sell stock of the big drilling companies, the um, public uh, listed companies, um, so I bet on falling, um, falling stock prices, um, 
put a Raspberry Pi or something like this in a couple of uh, field bus devices or um, Moxa um, Ethernet switches where I have power and everything so it's easy to do. And either I bribe somebody or I go on board myself, replace a couple of these and send this magic packet ra uh, randomly around the network. With random time differences, I can cause a rig downtime of at least eight weeks until they find that. Because all the, ti all the time, the electrician has to go and fix uh, and reboot uh, systems. And then, OK, whew, I'm done. Eight hours, nothing happens. And then again, a couple of them fail. Um, so I can drive people nuts. So they would have stopped to stop drilling for, for weeks. Uh, and they basically would have to rip up the system apart to find that. I like the way you're thinking. <laughs> you need to be able to think like an attacker to do this job. Uh, no, uh, as you mentioned it. So does this actually happen? Do you have any experience of actual attacks? Yes. Under the maritime? Oh, okay. Uh, what kind of attacks? Just the opportunistic way or really the planned way as you described with short selling and so on? We have seen um, quite a number of, um, well, the majority of the cases we have seen is collateral damage, like the NotPetya. It was just a computer that was kind of in the line of fire. Um, we've seen targeted attacks as well, mostly on the IT side, not so much really targeted attacks on the um, OT side in the systems we are drilling with. A very um, prominent targeted attack on OT was, of course, Stuxnet um, against the Iranian um, Atomic Energy Program, Atomic Energy Stress Weapons Program. So um, that was a very elaborate attack, obviously. Um, so they do exist. Now, a lot of these are attacks that happen are not publicized. The industry is, in my mind, way too too hesitant to publicize things, which ha mostly helps the attackers, not the defenders. But um, that's what it is. Of course, we make some money by knowing more than, than public, which is nice in a way, but I would rather like to have the systems to be safe. Good questions so far. Keep them coming. We still have some time. You've thankfully left quite a lot of time for Q&A, and yes. so far it's, it's... I don't it's believe in death by PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> Highly appreciated. Further questions? Come on. Yes, all the way up. Come on. <laughs> oh. I'll get my set counted. <laughs> so, um, looking at ships, I don't think the, the whole hardware there is, like, brand new out of the box currently. Do you see an improvement of the security posture with newer systems or does everything just get more complex? No, we do see, um, we do see both trends. We say, uh, see increased complexity, um, building in more links. And we also see um, companies, not all of them, but many, getting wiser uh, in terms of cybersecurity and uh, putting resources in there. The shipping industry is quite uh, fragmented. You have the big players that do have resources, they do have a willingness to invest, and then um, you see a lot of small players who do not really have the capabilities. And there is a major risk. I don't see... Um, the very big players as being risky. Um, where I do see the major risks is in supply chain risks. If the, one of the major um, container carriers, for example, gets affected um, in their booking system, for, for example, or the, um, like when Maersk was hit by NotPetya, they couldn't move cargo. Why? You have many, many containers on a, um, on a terminal and it's just too many to actually find a container in the stacks, four high and many rows uh, long, find the containers in the stacks to, uh, to coordinate the cranes to put the containers where they need to go. And um, it's just not, not practical to do this without computers, with a clipboard. 
And there we have um, significant supply chain um, issues afterwards. And what, what happens if the steering doesn't work? We have seen in the Suez Canal several times now. I yeah, think. The, um, the ever given in the Suez Canal that um, ran into the uh, bank of the Suez Canal and blocked the Suez Canal for a couple of weeks. That had tremendous impacts on global supply chains. And, um, and yeah, and we've seen the bridge in Baltimore, which now will probably block the port for it for weeks, minimum for weeks. And um, they are now starting to dismantle the broken bridge, but it will take some weeks to clear the river of the debris. And until then, one of the biggest ports in the United States is blocked. But it's just some computers. Why does it matter? We, why do we need IT security, right? <laughs> Any further questions before I start commenting, which is always a bad sign? Yes? From this side now. <laughs> uh, what do you think uh, we should do to improve the situation? Should the gov uh, government uh, regulate it um, more, or should we um, rely on the companies doing it? Itself, besides helping them uh, find their vulnerabilities? Um, we need to do both, and we have done both. Um, the um, maritime regulations are mostly um, done at the International Maritime Organization, which is a sub-organization of the United Nations, based in London, IMO. And safety management is part of the... Um, the International Convention for Safety of Life at Sea, SOLAS, and uh, the part of uh, SOLAS which is called the ISM Code, International Safety Management Code, that um, basically tells companies you need to manage all known risks, and cyber is a known risk. And two years ago, um, IMO actually got um, uh, passed a resolution that made cybersecurity mandatory for all companies to implement and all flag states which are the ones actually making the laws have to implement this by beginning of last year so since last year all shipping companies are and ships are audited on cyber security is it very deep no is it deep enough probably not so um, it is again kind of the smallest common denominator but it's a step in the right direction. So nobody can in the industry can now say, mm, we didn't know that's important or something like that. Um, the classification societies, which is basically the kind of companies like the one I'm working for that is doing the same as, uh, as the TÜV is doing for cars, um, have their regulations to make this more mandatory and from... Um, Basically, all new ships from middle of this year, from 1st of July, need to have much stronger cybersecurity defenses in place in hardware, so to speak. So, um, all new ships must have it built in. Yes. From what you said, it felt like this companies that built the systems and the components, they feel quite comfortable and not terribly afraid of competition or, um, or that they, they have to act fast to stay in the market. Um, is that also your impression and are there new companies that try to do better than what we're seeing now? Yeah, you're right. In the, um, in the um, ship control systems um, marketplace, there's there's only a relatively small number of global companies that hold the market. So in navigation, you have maybe eight companies um, doing that. And when you talk about integrated bridge systems and so on, it's nowadays about four, four global companies doing this. When you're talking drilling systems, you are basically talking about three, three players in the market. So um, do they have to fear competition? Between each other, yes, but um, it is it's very big business. We are talking 
a drill ship is typically um, 500 million to $1 billion, for example. So that's a um, significant investment. And so spending a few tens of $10,000 on cybersecurity is negligible compared to the total cost of a ship. Have you ever audited any military vessels? I'm not at liberty to say. <laughs> what about insurance companies? Uh, do they have uh, an impact on IT security with their premiums and stuff? Um, they do have an impact, as in um, you need um, to have a certificate from a classification society to get insurance for your ship. Without insurance, you're not allowed to sail, so it's, it's kind of mandatory. Um, the insurance companies have not yet um, diversified premiums based on your level of cybersecurity because they don't really have a good benchmark for that. So, um, but yes, that is an angle. We used to have cyber, cyber insurance policies. They have pretty much gone out of the market. Um, First, they were too expensive and nobody um, thought they needed them. And then when companies actually thought they needed them, the insurance companies stopped offering them because they have been um, extremely expensive for the insurance companies. So the risk is very hard to uh, calculate. Why? Again, because you have this cluster risk. Um, with cyber, you have many eggs in one basket. So if one um, common control system is vulnerable, then you get risk all over the place. It's uh, the different statistics um, as I, that I talked about before. Any other questions? You don't want me to ask questions. Yes, please. Wonderful. You mentioned that these ships need regular maintenance, uh, and I can see how the companies operating them could have a financial incentive to neglect to do that. Uh, do you know if manufacturers are aware of this potential risk or are implementing any mitigations? Um, yes, the, um, the hardware of the ships is generally pretty well maintained because um, the owner of the ship wants to have a decent resale value. You know, the <clears throat> for ships, we generally talk about 20 years lifetime, commercial lifetime. Some ships last longer, but that's just for simple cargo ships, usually the um, um, time. The ships need to be um, inspected basically every year. They need to have the big inspection every five years, which means taking the ship out of the water um, into the dry dock, because then the underwater paint needs to be renewed anyway. And um, so that is, is done by law and needs to be done. The um, um, control systems, also have typically 20 years lifetime, which is okay for a simple control system when it's not connected to anything. Um, so as long as it's, it's a standard PLC-based system, why not? Um, the physical environment hasn't changed much. The kind of waves and so on is still the same. Um, when you talk about stuff that is connected to the internet, the picture is completely different. Then you need to be way more on track with, uh, with updates. So um, yes, companies, now the, um, for the uh, systems like navigation and so on, you normally have maintenance contracts. And nowadays, um, companies buying ships are more aware of that they need to have a 20-year maintenance guarantee built into the supply contract. And or know that they will need to rip out everything after 10 years and replace it and just budget that in. And it's not actually the cost of the hardware and uh, the devices that is prohibitive here. It's mostly the downtime that it takes um, significant time to do that. And while you do that, ship's not operational. Any further questions, other questions? Some topics we haven't touched on upon yet. Well, if there are no more questions, going once, going twice, then I would say thank you very much uh, for your attendance and please give another very warm round of applause for Pricks. Thank you very much. Thank you.